Welcome everybody to today's Hassenfeld Institute seminar. I'm Amy Anthony. I'm the communications and outreach manager for the Hassenfeld Institute. And I'm happy to introduce our director and executive committee member, Dr. Patrick Vivier. Uh, Dr. Vivier is a professor of emergency medicine and professor of pediatrics in the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown and professor of health services policy and practice at Brown School of Public Health. Great. Thank you, Amy, and thank you for helping to organize this. I'm very excited today to have our two speakers uh, speaking at on the topic of improving school readiness, the role of pediatricians and early childhood educators. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Hassenfeld Child Health Innovation Institute, we re really bring together all the resources at Brown connecting with community partners on a broad range of maternal and child health issues. And one of the key has been this interface between um, health and education. We believe very strongly in the World Health Organization's definition of health as a complete state of physical and mental and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. And, and really believing that it's our responsibility that children can lead their fullest lives. And in Rhode Island, less than half of third graders are able are reading proficient in third grade, a critical issue since grades four on is really more reading to learn. And so these are incredibly important uh, health related topics. And that in all the time that's spent in pediatricians offices of assessing development and assuring that kids get a great start, if we're seeing these indicators in school, um, that it's not happening. We need to start thinking of innovative solutions. So I'm really thrilled today's talk, um, improving school readiness, the role of pediatricians and early childhood educators. We have two wonderful speakers. Um, here is Susanna Loeb, PhD, who is the director of the Annenberg Institute and professor of international and public affairs and education at Brown University. Her research focuses broadly on education policy and its role in improving educational opportunities for students. Her work has addressed issues of educator career choices and professional development of school finance and governance, and importantly, of early childhood systems. Um, she's joined by her colleague, Lisa Chamberlain, MD, MPH, a professor of pediatrics and associate chair of policy and community um, at Stanford's Department of Pediatrics. Um, Dr. Chamberlain's academic focus has been on reducing pediatric um, health disparities. As Stanford's Harmon faculty scholar, she studies kinder ready clinics, bridging the early childhood education and pediatric sectors to reduce educational inequality. Her health services research focuses on children with medical complexity, which has been used to increase access to care for kids in California. So we love uh, this interaction between pediatricians and educators and uh, I'll uh, bring it over to um, Dr. Loeb and Dr. Chamberlain to give us our talk today. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, thrilled to be here with you all today. Um, and I think we'll just dive in. Uh, Susan and I are gonna talk uh, for a little bit and then we hope to open it up for questions. So uh, I know sometimes people say, well, uh, why you, what are you doing here? Pediatrician uh, thinking about early childhood education. And this is a quote that I, I like to think about um, from one of my colleagues here at Stanford that pediatricians really do witness um, and are the ultimate inheritors of failed social policy. When I'm in clinic seeing patients and uh, particularly now during COVID, so many of my families are coming in talking about how um, they have not uh, been able to work. Unemployment is significant right now in our area. Um, uh, unable to have enough to buy diapers, unable to have enough food. Um, so I'm talking about food policy, I'm talking about you know, uh, labor policy, all these uh, different kinds of things. And so we find ourselves often inheriting uh, these issues. And one of the most significant ones uh, has been around early childhood education. Um, I uh, take care of patients in the community uh, where I see patients and I, I work in a mostly immigrant community. Uh, so I speak Spanish most of the time. And uh, these children have, the, I just think of them as these bright eyes. They're just these extraordinarily talented, eager, curious, wonderful kids. And um, and yet I found over time um, with my practices, I would see them for the, the five-year-old checkup, uh, getting them ready to go to school in that precious kindergarten time. Um, so many of them weren't really passing a lot of my kindergarten ready questions. Uh, and I was so surprised about this because they, you know, again, these bright eyes and these uh, talented, smart families. And I, I was curious what was happening. Um, and so uh, this, this 
kind of interest took me down um, a pathway. And it's kind of like, if I think of a clinical case, this isn't one child, but an amalgamation of, of who I would see, a four and a half year old kid who comes in for their school physical, uh, smart, inquisitive, he and I will flip back and forth between English and Spanish. Uh, and he fails these basic developmental screens. Um, and I you know, knew that this isn't a question of um, capacity, it's a question of exposure. Um, and that's because of a real lack of a system uh, that we have here. Um, and so as many of you know, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, there are a lot of disparities in terms of school readiness. Um, the issues that the literature talks a lot about, um, that children who live in poverty, children who are English language learners, children uh, who uh, come from minority backgrounds, and particularly when uh, the mother has a lower level of education, all of these are factors that contribute uh, to these disparities and uh, wind, wind up with this school readiness gap. And so one of the first things that, as I was starting to really evolve my understanding of this, um, the woman up in the right corner there, uh, Jamie Peterson was my fellow and we thought uh, she was also like me, a pediatrician in the community. And so she um, did a study looking at kindergarten readiness of the kids in our area. And um, when we administered kinder ready um, assessments, only 35% of the kids in her clinic uh, were kindergarten ready, also a, a immigrant serving community compared to the well-resourced community that we're near. Um, you, know, you can really see the differences there. Uh, and so with that understanding, we took that data back uh, to our clinic first. Uh, we do community-based participatory research. And so we're always partnering and sharing the data back and, and in the conversation with the nursing assistants and the MAs and um, some of the parents, they were just dumbfounded. They're like, what are you talking about? You know, what, what are we doing wrong? How can we help? Um, and, and one person particularly was moved and was crying. And I just was really struck by it. And I'm like, okay, this, this is a, a gap. Uh, and this is a, a, a something I think that we could really work to bridge. And, and wh where does this gap come from? This is structural. And because of my public health training, I, I don't think of like, what's wrong with these moms? Why aren't they doing this? No, it's not a question of individual behavior. It's a question of structures. And so when we think about structures for the zero to five population, nearly 100% are born in the hospital. Inevitably, during my training, when I would be on call in the emergency room, it seemed like most of them were born in the parking lot. But let's just assume that and most of them get into the hospital or are born in the hospital. But from that point on, from zero to two, um, a very small minority go into childcare. Um, and 84% 84, 84 are in very informal or experience no childcare settings. And then in the three to four year old space nationally, <clears throat> or I'm sorry, in our area, uh, about 58% are in some sort of preschool where nearly 42% you know, are not in preschool. And I know this from my clinic, we do not have enough Head Start spots. Um, preschool is out of reach for many families. Um, and then we, they get to that point where they're doing that physical with me and they're headed into kindergarten and we're back to 100%. So you can see that we really have this full capture of kids right at the beginning and then as they enter school. Um, but in between there, we have a very fragmented system that is not equally accessible to everyone. That said, the healthcare system, I, in the, in the pediatric clinics, we see these families repeatedly, 100% of them. We're seeing them for their well checkups, we're checking developmental uh, assessments, we're um, giving them their shots. And so I could really see how this part of the system, uh, the, the clinical component, might be a great way to reach all of these children. What do we currently do in clinic? Right now, we do screen all mothers for depression um, initially. And so um, that captures a small group of people who are struggling uh, with depression. Um, and then we do do screening for developmental delay. Um, that is a more recent recommendation, um, but it, it, and it is critical. And so we will pick up the 15% of kids that have particular delay, developmental delays, speech delays, um, cognitive uh, issues, et cetera. But 85% of the kids don't have those delays. And for those kids, we really aren't offering more. We're saying, okay, great, you're not delayed, good job. Uh, we'll give them a book sometimes with reach out and read, but we don't do more than that. And that's where I feel like there's really an opportunity for growth. Um, and so we started thinking about these ideas of creating these kinder ready clinics. What if all of our pediatric clinics were structured to make sure that 100% of their five-year-olds, when they're moving into that kindergarten space, what if all of them were kindergarten ready? All of them. That, I mean, that would just be an amazing thing. 
Um, and so we start thinking about what, what would that take? How do we partner with parents? How do we provide access to the tools for early learning? How do we really change the narrative at a population level that this is how we all work together to help our zero to five-year-olds in partnership with the early childhood community? So that took me to my sabbatical, uh, and I'm so glad that it did. Um, I had time in 2016, and I was thinking more and more about these educational ideas, and I was like, Ah, I'm over here at the Stanford School of Medicine, which is in the upper right corner. And, and, and at that time, Dr. Loeb was at the Stanford School of Education down in the, the bottom right. I'm up in the upper left. And, and uh, it, it's a big campus and it's structurally difficult. <laughs> we all live in di very different silos. Um, but I, I crossed campus. I left my office uh, at the School of Medicine. I closed it up. I went over, I got an office in Sousa's building and spent a year uh, understanding what is the evidence uh, that we have? What can we learn from early childhood education experts? And how can we bring uh, opportunities for interventions that could potentially go to scale into our clinics? What could that look like? And uh, telling the rest of that story today is, is what we wanted to do. Um, and so our idea was this convergence of education and health and what we could do um, in our local safety net cent centers. Um, and our hypothesis was, could we take these health clinics and organizations uh, could these organizations improve the literacy levels of our young children from the most disconnected families, th those families that aren't in preschool? And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Lowe. Hi, uh, it's very nice to be here. And I love the introduction, Lisa. That's a really nice framing of it. It was so fun to have Lisa be in the, the ed school with me that year. And um, we got to talking. And at the time I was working with preschools on a program that, um, because they had come to me and said, our parents, we really want to engage better with our parents. They have so much potential to help with their students and we really, what kinds of supports can we give them? And so together we designed this program, which I'm gonna tell you about called Tips by Text. And Sam Madison, who I see here, uh, runs this program with me here at uh, Brown. Um, so the idea of the Tips by Text project is that if you can provide really small bits of information and make it really easy uh, for parents to um, have things that they can do, and you do this over a long period of time, you can change adult behavior in ways that really can impact students. So instead of trying something that's super intensive, trying to get parents to kind of change their understanding of things or um, redo their schedules, things that are really, really hard for parents. The idea of this was that um, many parents are really busy and if we can instead fit our, our um, supports for them into the lives that they lead, they so much want their children to succeed and to do this that they will uh, really engage. And um, I'm, I don't quite remember these slides, but keep going, Lisa. Um, so our, our premise is really that adults, and this isn't just parents, these are teachers and principals and doctors, they, they affect ch children and youth. We know that adults in children's lives are just key to their development. And they vary very much in the effectiveness. Some parents are really great and some parents aren't so great at helping their children develop skills. And some of that is by, varies by social, uh, by economic group. Some parents have lots more demands on their time than other parents do, but even just very similar, parents in very similar um, positions can be very different in what they do. And they really want to be good but what we found is that teachers and principals and parents, it's very, very difficult to change what adults do even when they wanna change. But our goal was to see if we could utilize what we've, our new knowledge about um, how you change adult behavior given that we're all so hard to change um, and do it for the benefit of children. So that's really what our project had been about. Um, one of the, the things that we realized is that parents have a huge number of choices they have to make for kids. And some of them are um, big, difficult choices, where to live, what school to send them to, whether to send them to preschool, 
um, parent kind of overall parenting approaches, but some of them are more like what to say with your child when you see them, what to, whether to do the dishes at a certain time or to play a game, just these minute to minute um, decisions that you have to make. And many of them have so many options that surprisingly enough, it creates a really heavy cognitive load that you're like, oh my God, I could do this, or I could do that, or I could do this, or I could do that. And in the moment, those having many choices tends to make people freeze. And this actually comes from the marketing literature, surprisingly enough. There's a really great study of um, selling jam. And when you have uh, people actually near where Lisa and I used to live, went to the markets and put jam on tables, either six or 24 kinds of jams. And they got something like 10 times as many people buying from tables with six kinds of jams than with 24 kinds of jams. That, that too much choice um, really freezes people. And you can imagine the amount of choice you have just interacting with your child each day. And so what happens when you have so much choice is it leads parents to default to things that they know. So either you don't do anything, you're like, oh my gosh, no jam. I'm not gonna ask my child a question because I don't know what question to ask. Or I'm just gonna ask the same kind of questions my friends ask their kids or my parents ask me. And it leads to this kind of intergenerational transfer of behaviors, which can disadvantage families who grew up in places that didn't expect um, five-year-olds to have the kinds of skills that we're talking about. So that even when goals and knowledges are the same, sorry to go back for one more, um, you can get very different outcomes. And it's similar, of course, resources and information matter, but there's also things like just getting your attention on making a choice of asking questions to kids or playing with kids um, can be really difficult. And they're even more difficult when uh, the cognitive load is high, when you have multiple jobs, when you're stressed about providing food and these other kinds of things, it just gets more and more difficult. So it doesn't have to do so much with the goals and knowledge, but with these kinds of other things that are going on. Okay, sorry. Mm, my bad. Um, and then you take a look at what parenting programs have done and they're just awful for this kind of uh, situation that parents are in. If you go to the parenting sessions, I hate, have always hated this as a parent. You go and you're, you know, you get this manual of what you're supposed to do with your children, or you're supposed to fill out these intense forms or read these things. It's just really, it's really hard to do if you've got lots of other things going on. Sometimes the parenting programs are inconvenient. They'll be at school at night and you have to get there. If they, they don't happen often. And as a result of not happening often, you're not kind of, it doesn't hold your attention over time. Um, when they do do it well, when you get a regular home visit um, and can, uh, with follow-up, those kinds of things actually do uh, uh, show some substantial change, but they've been expensive and really small scale. We haven't been able to replicate them or, or to expand them a sufficient amount in the US. So what we tried to do was to design a program that got over these barriers. It was a parenting curriculum. The idea is to provide very small bits of information over time for light cognitive load, to break down the complexity of parenting, parenting into really small steps that are easy to achieve so you don't have to choose. Uh, we wanna remind parents to interact often so we, to hold attention. Um, and just to provide continuous encouragement and support so that you feel good about what you're doing. And we're, we uh, did it using text messages. So that's why the Tips by Text program. Um, so the idea, so what we did basically is design a program that on Monday sends a fact tip with information. This is an important thing for your child to learn. On Wednesday, we, we send something they can do related to that. And then on Friday, we sent encouragement um, and another tip. And uh, we do it for the whole school year and in multiple languages. Um, and here's just an example. This with a fact. The concept and mo of more and less is important for learning later math skills like addition and subtraction, and it helps children think about the world. So these kinds of uh, things about more and less are important. Tip, compare groups at home. Ask, do you have more pants or shirts? Have them check by counting. Think together about why you have different or the same amount. Growth, keep counting. 
You're preparing your child for K. During bath time, put water in two plastic cups, one with more, ask which has less, can you make them the same? So this would just being, this is a math example, what Lisa and I are gonna talk about more is literacy. We tended to do math, literacy and social emotional skills together. But um, you can see in the way they're designed, the first one would come on Monday, the second one on Wednesday and the third on Friday, even though it actually turns out it's better on the weekend now that we've tested it out. But um, so, um, but they're very, they're very specific in what you can do and you can apply them really easily in, in day-to-day -day life. And many of them are just about walking across the room. So we did a random control trial with preschool parents because you know, I'm, I'm in education, I work with school districts. And um, because of this, the, the youngest we can get students is in preschool. And so over a couple of year period, we worked with a small group, about a thousand preschool um, families, we randomized um, the, we randomized them into either getting this or not getting this. I think that's good enough for this slide. And um, what we found is we asked parents to report on what they've done and they reported positively um, about point, little uh, 0.18 standard deviations that they did more of these things. Um, uh, what they're asked, hmm, their children's friend, their child's interest, book recommendation. I'm not really sure what this, this is just like the different things that they, they are doing that they report. I think I might have, oh, this is the positive effects on teachers, sorry. Is there one before this or did I just cut and paste the wrong thing? No, no. I think that was okay. the next one. So we asked parent, parents, uh, we asked teachers to report back to us whether the parents did things. Did they come in and talk to them about different things? Because that was our only way of kind of observing interactions, parent interactions, um, because we couldn't actually go into the home and, and observe. And what we found is that teachers reported that parents came in and talked to them more if they had been receiving the text. So the ones that were randomly assigned to the texting program um, came in and asked about what their child is doing with school, um, how their child gets along with others, things that the parent that they as parents could do to help their kids. So we found effects on there. I, and this I just put in twice. So let's go on to the next yeah, one. Right. We right. found some effects on parents reported things too. Um, in the first year that we did it, um, we didn't find generally positive effects on average, but we did in the second year of about 0.15 standard deviations. The first year we had a few issues, particularly with Asian families, because we, uh, there's a large population of Chinese families in this district and we had some texting issues in the beginning. But in general, we didn't find such great results on average the first year, but we did the second year. And this is about a month and a half of learning. You can go on to the next one. But in both years, if we looked at students who started in the lower half of the test score distribution, the, the less strong students, we saw more than three months of learning in both years of the program. So just by this program, which really costs, you know, approximately $2 per parent, not including the research, but about $2 per parent for the year, it gave us about um, a little over three months of learning in um, this is a program of a test called PALS, which is a early literacy test developed at the University of Virginia that we, we um, the district gave three times a year to the students. Okay. So generally what we found is we found positive effects on early literacy that was for everybody once, not in our pilot year, but in our second year, but in both years for the students who were uh, started the year at uh, in the bottom half of the distribution, we found that it improved their um, literacy score by about three and a half months. Um, the ev we found evidence that it was, it came from changes in parenting behavior, um, and what's interesting too is how much the parents like this. Like we have an opt-in in another district. And so you have to opt into it, but through the enrollment and we still get over 90% of families opting into it and very few drop out as they go through. Um, here even less because they, uh, they didn't, 
um, this was right in the beginning, but they this was something like 1% dropped out. It's somewhere between one and 10%. So you get really high uh, parent buy-in as you're there. But one of the problems that we ran into is that yes, this was great, but we were only reaching kids who were already in preschool, which means we didn't reach the fam many of the families that Lisa was talking about whose kids didn't go to preschool, even though this was a kind of a, a public preschool, so it was income eligible, but there's still a group that we weren't missing that way. Um, and we couldn't get kids under four. And so it seemed like such a good opportunity for um, once Lisa came to think together about how maybe we could work through health clinics instead of through the education system to try to support parents uh, for, for younger kids. All right. So then that took us back to um, uh, the work that Susan and I got to do together. So as she just articulated, she'd had great evidence that this worked and the kids they could reach in the public preschools. And we said, well, wow, what if we could try to reach the kids who aren't even getting into preschool? And so we uh, went down to Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, which is our public hospital in San Jose, uh, an enormous center, eight outpatient clinics, very busy clinics, and enrolled our three and four-year-olds who were interested uh, only we had to speak English or Spanish. So as Suze had alluded to, we have a lot of Vietnamese speaking families, Chinese, a lot of other languages, but for this study, uh, we really just went with English and Spanish. The children couldn't have any developmental delay and uh, could not have, uh, were not enrolled in preschool. So we really wanted to isolate that group of kids that we know uh, were not in preschool, the most disconnected from the early childhood system um, at that time. So we enrolled those kids. And we, just to show you that, that what's the only thing that's different about the text, we use Susan's excellent evidence-based text, but we started them with doc says every time. So as we enrolled them, we said, now, you know, we're, your doctor's gonna be sending you messages. So we, we tried to add that physician voice um, to see if that mattered. Um, you know, your doctor says, on the way home is a great time to build your child's knowledge of letter sounds, you know? So kind of the same exact thing, fact, tip, growth. And these are all Susan's texts, I don't, that is her expertise, not mine. Um, but we, we did add this kind of um, wh where it was coming from, that it came from the doctor. So our project aims were in to increase literacy levels of three and four-year-olds who were receiving their primary care with us to enhance parent-child interactivity in language and to just determine feasibility. Is this going to work? Um, these are super busy public clinics and could we get families to do it? Would they let us keep texting them? Are they going to change their texting plan or their phone number and we're going to lose half of them? Are they not going to like it and are, gonna, are they going to drop out? Um, is it going to drive all the nurses crazy uh, with questions? We didn't know. We'd never tried to do any kind of um, intervention with texting before. Um, and so there was just a, a very fundamental feasibility question as well. So it was a, we also did an RCT. Uh, and then we also did a qualitative study uh, for families that were in the intervention arm to see what they thought about it. Uh, we used the same kind of assessment tools that Sue's used, um, assessing the parent-child interactivity and the PALS pre-K out of the University of Virginia. And basically we found great effects, very similar to what Sue's did. Um, for the overall treatment effect, um, we had an effect size of 0.26 that was significant. Um, when we adjusted for the baseline um, pre-K score, uh, as well as the child's age, you can see their effect size is uh, 0.2. And in our third model, uh, when we adjusted for the PALS pre-K, the baseline age and language assessment um, was 0.29. And these numbers don't mean anything uh, to <laughs> a lot of the people who are curious, uh, particularly our County Board of Supervisors who uh, you know, are really just interested in does it matter to kids? And so uh, the thing that I think is important is to turn it in these kinds of statistics into language that matter to policymakers and parents. And it, these findings equate to three months of literacy gains in a seven month intervention. So it's, it's a very significant uh, gain in literacy for the short amount of time that these families were receiving text. We also then went to look at uh, what kind of heterogeneity is there for the different groups? Did it matter? Um, the family size, the birth order, et cetera. And what we found was that the effects were more significant for a firstborn child uh, when the family was not a single parent family. So when the family had uh, more than one adult caregiver and for children who were older. So this had more of an impact uh, the older that the child was. 
We also, as I said, uh, did some qualitative evaluation uh, led by Dr. Janine Bruce on the upper right and one of our medical students, Liz Conley. And so they did focus groups with parents who were receiving these texts for more than three months and they explored uh, the domains that you see there, program satisfaction, parent-child interactivity and feasibility. Um, it looked at some demographics and then did qualitative data analysis. And Suze, I haven't told you this was just accepted for publication, so it'll be coming out very soon. Um, so they basically had five themes that they found um, was that uh, the parents really felt these were novel ways um, for using texts, that they weren't used to getting parenting things through text, but they liked it. Um, they shared the text with other people, which we didn't know. And I'm like, please don't share them with anyone in the control group. But obviously, you would never know that. But I hope they didn't. Um, the parents did leverage the authority of the pediatrician voice. So that was interesting. They said sometimes the kids would be like, oh, I don't feel like reading. It's like your doctor said we had to, so sit down. Uh, so there was something about that authority. Um, they said overall just increase their focus on academics and that they did like the texting and that it seemed feasible to integrate things into their daily routines. So just a couple quotes. I feel like I just love bringing the parent voices into this. Um, so uh, this is from a Spanish speaking mom or parent, um, I feel more comfortable making direct and specific questions about things she might not be able to do. For example, if she was unable to distinguish between colors, I would know this. Um, another one, it has helped me because I can say, this is that doctor thing. Uh, the doctor wants you to draw, so he'll start to draw. It's helped me a lot um, because you know the doctor, the doctor says to, and sometimes he doesn't want to. Uh, fostering interactivity, every time I would get the messages at work, and this is to see this thing, maybe weekends would be better. <laughs> I thought, how am I gonna ask him this question? Or how am I going to do this? We started talking more, dialoguing more between the two of us. He started talking to me about things that happened at school that were related. We are dialoguing more. Again, Spanish speaking parent. And then having this educational uh, ripple. Oh, I think the texts are very uh, handy. I forwarded them to my friend. Um, you know, just you can read it. Um, but basically, so, you know, this idea that there was a lot of spread so that you could, in doing this with the families, kind of create these different uh, community ripples. So future directions, um, we're currently working on uh, going down to younger children, uh, two and three year olds. Again, especially once you get in that zero to three space, that really is where the pediatric office has the most points of contact with the kids really before they start transitioning into the early childhood education space. Um, and we're looking at texting uh, a trial around math and language, um, possibly also around socio emotional development. Um, there's some limitations and some challenges. Um, so I throw that out there in case there's people in the audience with expertise that um, could strengthen our work. So I wanted to say a, a little bit more switching gears from the texting uh, just in this last section um, that texting is one uh, modality for strengthening uh, the, the kind of school readiness in a family. Um, but there are other things as well, like a school readiness coach in the clinics, um, providing more access to tools and changing the narrative. So these are other things that we're also doing in our community. And I just wanted to show you a little bit about what this looks like. So again, trying to create this transformed clinic that really focuses on kinder readiness. And the work where I'm doing this work um, is through something called IMPACT, which is the Mid-Peninsula Pediatric Advocacy Coalition. These are pediatric physicians and, and uh, providers who work in my region. Um, we've all been working together uh, for about five years and have taken on everything from food insecurity to mental, increasing mental health support for our families. We um, take care of all the publicly insured children in our region uh, through either county-based clinics, uh, federally qualified health centers, or an academic center. And this is a kind of a Google map view of our region. Um, you can see there's Stanford University in our nursery, and um, it's a very dense peninsula, uh, dense uh, urban area, um, but we have county clinics, FQHCs, and academic clinics. Um, but together, taken together, these five clinics take care of 50% of the children in this region and 100% of the publicly insured children. So we are together taking care of all of the zero to five-year-olds. So we started a program called Talk, Read, Sing uh, and have distributed over 2,400 bundles since 2017. Uh, the parents get these bundles. Um, you can see in the upper left there, they're onesies, they're t-shirts, they're CDs for singing. Um, and they get them when the baby's born in the nursery. And then they get them at nine months and then again at 18 months. And again, they're getting this messaging the whole time about the importance of talk, reading, and singing to your baby. This has also been a public service campaign um, through First Five California. So there are a lot of ads that use these exact images in this language 
uh, these little cartoons um, on bus build, on bus placards, on billboards, on Spanish radio. So it's uh, trying to change kind of the population level narrative around early childhood support. We also started little libraries. This was the uh, corner of the waiting room in my clinic, which would like mock me every day I would walk into work. It would kill me that it was like this empty bookshelf um, with like magazines or something on it. So we turned it into a space that looked like that by leveraging um, uh, volunteers who donate books um, and just turned it into this book space for the kids and the kids can go take a book off the shelf and take it home. Uh, so you can see some of the numbers there of how many uh, books we have distributed. All of those clinics now have these little libraries in them. We've also started story times. Um, so in those corners in the book uh, space in the waiting room, we have Stanford students and other volunteers who sit on the floor and read to the children and um, model for parents how to do book sharing with kids. Um, there's another picture of a before there where normally this is what our waiting rooms look like and they're just playing some loop of, you know, SpongeBob or something else like this um, and, and had some murals put in. So turned it into these um, beautiful spaces uh, full of learning. This is another example of a waiting room that went from what's on the left to there on the right. Uh, and you can see we did a narrative piece in the American Journal of Public Health about what do our clinical environments say to our children when the families walk in you look at that room on the left, what does that say about how we value those children, what we believe in their potential versus the room you would walk into on the right. Um, and the walls are interactive and you can do all these different things. So um, uh, the clinics are all in the process of, of changing the waiting rooms so that the walls are speaking to the families while they wait. Um, and so uh, we're evaluating this right now is when you take these different components, the libraries, the murals, the texting, the coaching, uh, the Talk, Read, Sing program. When you take all of that and put it together into a clinic, how does that change uh, how the clinic operates? How does it change the providers? How does it change what the families experience? And our goal is to develop kind of a roadmap. How do you as a clinic go from being one that hasn't been thinking like this before to one that is over the course of time? Uh, so it's kind of more of an anthropological evaluation. Uh, and that is being led by the um, School of Education at Stanford, the John Gardner Center. Um, they're leading the evaluation as um, our clinics are transforming themselves into school ready clinics. I'm learning about this implementation science methodology. It's very interesting. It's a different analytic approach, but it's, it's really interesting. So in conclusion, I uh, just wanted to say, you know, there are these big gaps in kinder readiness um, and low income kids uh, starting behind is, is not how this country is gonna get ahead. So uh, really excited about the potential of pediatrics joining in the early childhood education community and creating a system where we're all kind of working together. And I do think what we bring to the table is that we have access to these kids, repeated trusted access with their families. Um, and while we don't have the expertise of exactly what they need, that's why we need partners like Dr. Loeb and uh, uh, early childhood education professionals to partner with us and, and to kind of go beyond our silos to work together to create new solutions. And we do need more of these evidence-based scalable solutions um, that we can deploy so that we can narrow this gap. So with that, I will conclude and hopefully we can open it up for a little discussion. Terrific. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Chamberlain and Dr. Loeb. I think that was a, a terrific talk on this important topic. Um, want to encourage folks, we'll have some time now for questions and discussions. You can uh, either raise your hand. So I'm gonna, I see the first person to do that. Um, uh, Dr. Weddle, Fox, do you wanna ask the first question? Just so folks know they can either physically raise their hand, I'll be looking at the gallery or you can shoot us a, a chat. But um, Dr. Weddle, do you wanna start? I would love to, thank you. This is fascinating. I'm a gerontologist, so I work at the other edge of the lifespan, but started my career in graduate school testing little children and observed much of what you've observed. So it's wonderful to see what you're doing. I had one observation, and one question. One is that what you're doing is something that we're learning about a lot in public health, which is the concept of nudges. You know, that you give people little nudges and it really, um, it's not overwhelming and it helps them change their behavior. And I love seeing how you've created that using a new technology that seems to be comfortable with people. I did want to ask a question about the literacy levels of the parents. And I noticed that in Dr. Loeb's nudges, um, that the literacy level seemed quite high. 
in the examples. And I noticed that in Dr. Chab Chamberlain's um, nudges that the, the literacy level seemed to be more, uh, seemed to be the lower level, but still getting the concepts across. And I wondered your thoughts about that. They're actually from the same program. I just chose a math one that was that we used in a more complicated place. It wasn't actually the ones we used um, in in a, in a place with um, more educated families. It wasn't the ones that we used in this uh, this program with Lisa. We do um, we do do some kind of assessment of that, and it varies a lot. We just uh, did a program uh, in. Uh, rural China that Xiao Yang Yi, who's on here too, has been helping with. And that one, we really had to, to bring down the literacy level in there. And even then, I'm not sure we hit it, but we do try to adjust it for the, for the right levels. Um, so, but that is, that is a really good question. And I would say um, you're absolutely right. If the literacy levels are too high, it won't work at all. And um, our families, I would say, for the most part, our high school level literacy, um, like eighth grade, um, I'll occasionally have a family that, a mom that really doesn't read or, or write much at all. They'll sign for the immunizations by making an X. Um, but that's an exception. Um, I would say that most have had through eighth grade and um, some high school. So um, yeah, the, the, but it, you're right. It, you need to be very attentive to that and watch, um, watch how you write them. Related to that, I think one issue that we ran into, if you see our results worked better for four-year-olds than for three-year-olds in our sample, I actually don't think it worked better for four-year-olds than for three-year-olds. The parents didn't say it did or anything, but I think our assessment worked better for four-year-olds than for three-year-olds. So we really have to be careful with that as well. It could have been that it worked better for four-year-olds, but I do think it was that the, the assessment was too much of a kinder-ready assessment. Yeah. I think we're really limited by our ability to have assessments that can detect small changes um, because some of them are really designed to detect developmental delay. So they're designed to take a group and say, you have a problem and this group is fine as opposed to say this group versus this group versus this group, all of whom are fine, but maybe not as high uh -huh. as they could be. Um, so that, that's really been, a rate limiting step in all of this is, especially with math and other things we're learning is how do you assess that nuanced difference in kids? If you can nudge them up a little bit, can you measure it? And can you measure it well in younger children? There's, there's much more for four-year-olds that's validated than for three-year-olds or two-year-olds. And so we have to raise more money essentially to do it because the younger kids, it takes more effort to assess them well. Absolutely. Can I follow up on, on Dean Weddle's question? The, 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 in two ways, in two directions on the nudge. A, the, the feedback was from uh, three months, those were at at least three months. Is there any sort of longer term of how long does the nudge feel a good thing versus you're over nudging? And, and my other sort of opposite question is, do you attach anything directly to the nudge? Is there a link to a website? Is there a, a phone line or anything that gives them more opportunity if they're particularly uh, motivated by this nudge. So either too much nudging or too much uh, or, or more added to the nudge. Can you talk about that a little bit? So I'll, I'll take a shot at it and then Lisa, you, sh you can try. So, um, so we always say, we have one paper that's called more than a nudge because I do think it is a nudge because, uh, but generally nudges are kind of to hold people's attention. They're like, take your pill, take your pill, take your pill, exercise, 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 that kind of thing. And what I think was, was kind of nice about this approach is it uses that, but instead it's making things you want to do easier to do. So ask this question instead of being like, oh, but I really don't want to exercise. It's like, oh, that just made it easier because I don't have to think about it and I can ask something and then I feel good about it. And so we haven't really seen, we haven't done it for many, many years, but we haven't seen a drop off um, in a second year of, of doing this. So now parents may not be reading it. We can't see that, but they don't, they don't leave. Um, they don't leave. They don't decide that they don't want it very often at all. And in fact, we get requests for can, I was just taught, we've done it in uh, Denmark with uh, immigrants there. And the parents there are asking for another year. We just finished it. And so I think we're getting requests for that. 
Um, it is tricky on the, should we put a link to more information? So we got that in what parents said in our first, when we asked them during our first year of doing this. And then we added in links and really nobody like, <laughs> clicked on them. Like we'd see a click and, and the person next to me, Eileen would be like, oh no, that was just me. <laughs> you know. So it would be so rare that it would be one of us. And I think, and then I worry that it actually makes it more stressful to have a link. Mm -hmm. And we tried in one place to kind of test directly links versus no links, but we didn't actually end up being able to get the data from the state. So I'm still struggling to know whether it made a difference or not. But I think it could really go either way. Once you start putting more information, you're kind of telling parents, well, you're not doing as much as you should be doing. And I don't want to stress them out as, at all. So I don't really know what the, the answer to that is. What I'll add is that uh, we had a similar experience of, as Suze did that very few families dropped out. I think we had like like four families out of, out of all of ours. Um, and we ended up with about 400 total um, opt out and say, please stop texting me. Everyone else continued and we had no one get disrupted from a, a phone number perspective. So from that feasibility, um, it was very feasible and, and very accepted by the families. And again, this is the disconnected group that Suze had never texted before. Um, those families that uh, for a wide range of reasons were not in preschool. And we looked at the demographics of those kids and they were kids who were much more likely to speak Spanish at home, much more likely to live in a deeper level of poverty. Um, they had younger parents. So we know that the families that uh, we reached through the clinic were uh, kind of more your traditionally uh, struggling families to begin with. And they also um, enjoyed the texts. Um, the main thing we heard back from them um, about like, what, what else would you like? They said, we wanna be able to text you back. We want to text the doctor back and um, or call if we have questions. And so we really heard that. So, you know, we're trying to think of, you know, if there were really common questions, could we use an AI, an artificial intelligence kind of system to uh, answer back um, common questions uh, just because the volume would probably be too much, again, threatening the scale of, of the intervention. Um, but, you know, would there be some sort of uh, way we could approach that? But those are my thoughts on the texting question. Great. The next question is from Matthew Tinsley. Matthew, do you want to just jump in? Hi there. Yeah, uh, my question is for Dr. Loeb. Um, I was really intrigued in your teacher measures to see what looked like a relatively solid effect on sort of family engagement, right? That teachers were reporting um, that families participating in the program were, were more likely to engage, more likely to follow up. It's, it's a little bit of... Um, I won't say holy grail, but it's something of a, a lot of interest, I think, in education is how do you foster and encourage family engagement? And I was wondering if you could share more about that, whether you had sort of explored it more fully, anything along those lines. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's a really great question. We haven't explored it more fully. In part, it's, it's a hard thing to collect all the data because the teachers have to fill it out separately for each child in the class. So we've only done this on a small scale and that's, I mean, for that study we did it, but we haven't done it in other places. Um, I think, again, that if you can make it easy for parents to reach out to teachers, like giving them suggested questions and those kinds of things, you, you might be, able, that might be one of the, the reasons. I'm trying to think if in that program, which we might have said, you know, if you want to, you can ask your teacher this question or something like that, and that might have helped. Um, in preschool, it's less, sometimes less of an issue than in rest of the schools because parents are so much more likely to be picking their kids up at school. And so that interaction is more normal than it is for in the other areas. But I do think that reducing the boundaries um, is really important. So not in this study, but in a related study, we've been working with teachers on this kind of home teacher relation, this uh, parent teacher relationship and having the uh, encouraging both sides to reach out to each other. And I do, I think this, uh, I'm kind of speaking in circles here, but I think these barriers that I'm talking about are particularly high um, with this kind of uh, relationship. If you can tell the parents specific questions to ask, or even 
recommend to the teachers specific questions to ask the parents, you're much more likely to make it happen because that barrier of what question should I ask? Am I going to look stupid? Will they, you know, will they respond in the way I want them to? If they, if you're given a question that someone has said is a legitimate good question and you're interested in the answer, you're much more likely to ask it. And it's what's been interesting for us is that's true for teachers to parents as well as for parents to teachers. Like parent, teachers don't really know immediately what to talk to parents about either, except, you know, your child was misbehaved in school. And that's not really the, the right way to kind of develop of those types of relationships. So I do think it's that um, thinking about how we take those barriers down can be really helpful. Um, and I think one of the things that the texting program uh, for the districts that we've been working in has been really helpful is for teachers to understand that the parents really want to do this. Even though the teacher sends things home and the parents don't fill it out, or the parents don't do what the teachers want them to do, the, it's easy for the teachers then to conclude, well, the parents just aren't involved, they don't care about it. But if you look at the materials that teachers send home with parents, I don't know, uh, that teachers send home to parents, I don't know if you have kids, but if you do, you will see what comes into parents, sometimes for parents, even for parents like us who feel very comfortable with uh, material that's in English and is and you, we can read long text, it's very hard for us to actually do the things they want us to do. So you can imagine how hard it is for other parents. So for the district, that's been that's been a very important thing. So I can't tell you so much from research except from these this kind of dynamics that we've seen in the district as a result. One of the things that. Um... I realized I, I kind of left out and, and what I think is important about uh, the, this potential opportunity is the disruption of cell phones and the disruption of technology in this way. Um, in the past, uh, all of our physician work was always on charts and, and paper. Um, and we have made this massive transition to the electronic health record and everything is um, obviously now done in computers and, um, and we have this real ability to be able to um, reach families because we are texting them now a lot. Don't forget your appointment, don't forget. So we have a new modality and a new way to reach families about don't forget to take your pill. I mean, that's most of the literature around the, the electronic health record, the EHR and its utility in helping uh, to narrow this gap between patients and their physicians and, and caregivers. And so um, one of the things that I think is so exciting at this time is this opportunity um, you know, that say five years from now, I can see a patient and have a little drop down, you know, field that says, you know, prescribe these literacy texts. He's four years old, he needs literacy texts. He's two years old, he needs social emotional texts or whatever. But I mean, it could be, um, it, it's a new modality uh, to be able to reach families if we have the evidence that it, that it makes a difference, that it moves the needle. Um, and that in a pre-EHR electronic health record world really was less of a possibility. Uh, so that's one of the things I think is um, opportune about this time and opportune about the role of the health sector uh, in joining the early childhood education world. Terrific. Well, we're coming near the end of the hour. Uh, I don't know if there's any other questions or um, I don't see any at the moment. I don't know if there's any sort of last words from our two presenters that, that you would like to say. We miss Sue. Come back. No, <laughs> uh, no I've, I've enjoyed the collaboration very much. And it's hard to work in a transdisciplinary way. Um, there were challenges. And even now, writing things up and analyzing things, we think of things differently. And so there, while there are challenges, I think, in working across disciplines, I also think there's a real spark of opportunity and innovation uh, that can come from partnering and uh, from seeing things, the same challenge through different eyes. And so anyway, I just really welcome and have enjoyed the transdisciplinary work that we've had now for four years, five years, and would encourage people um, to think about reaching outside your discipline to create partnerships to address complicated problems. Yeah, it's been, a, it's really been a joy. And I see the benefits of writing, you know, two page papers instead of <laughs> these massive <laughs> things that we have to write. Um, yeah, that's it's, really it's been wonderful.
Terrific. Well, on that note of interdisciplinary, uh, I want to thank both of our speakers very much. I also want to thank everyone who attended and your, your questions. Please uh, keep an eye out for our, our future Hassenfeld seminars. Uh, take care, everybody. Oh, and thank, thank you, you to Amy for your organization. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Take care. Thank you.